This year, we as horror fans are going to be gifted with a film from director Oz Perkins. That movie is called Long Legs and stars Micah Monroe as well as the fascinating actor Nicolas Cage. As anyone may know, Cage has starred in many different types of films, especially horror, and here, he stars as a serial killer who gives off some very Geppetto-esque vibes. Regardless, we here at Joe Blow will be their opening day for the film. As stated a minute ago, we recognize that Cage is vast in various types of genres, but this wasn't his first dip in the pool of horror. Today on Horror Revisited, we're exploring Martin Scorsese's underrated film, Bringing Out the Dead, which stars Nicolas Cage in one of his most honest, endearing, and albeit best roles. So turn on the sirens, strap in, and let's tour Manhattan as we check out Bringing Out the Dead. Frank! Uh, are you okay? I never felt better in my life. How are you? I'm good. Good. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. For those of you that don't know the plot of the film, let's quickly go over it. In this movie, we follow the intense life of Frank Pierce, a haunted paramedic in Manhattan. Set over three harrowing nights, the film delves into Frank's psychological turmoil and sense of despair as he navigates the chaotic, often gruesome world of emergency medical services. Haunted by the ghosts of those he couldn't save, particularly a young girl named Rose, Frank battles insomnia, guilt, and deteriorating sense of reality. Amidst his nightly encounters with drug addicts, homeless individuals, and other distressed souls, Frank forms a fragile connection with Mary Burke, the daughter of a heart attack victim he's trying to save. The film explores themes of redemption, human suffering, and the thin line between life and death, all set against the gritty backdrop of New York City. While this may come as a surprise, it isn't an original idea. This was adapted from the novel of the same name by author Joe Connolly. Connolly's novel drew heavily from his own experiences as a paramedic in Hell's Kitchen, New York. The book offers a raw, unflinching look at the life of an EMT and the emotional toll of constantly dealing with life and death situations. Its vivid depiction of the urban landscape, coupled with the psychological depth of its protagonist provide a fertile ground for a cinematic adaptation. Just keep driving, keep moving, no stopping, we're sharks. We stop too long, we die. And in 1998, producer Scott Rudin acquired the rights to the novel through Paramount Pictures for a film adaptation. Paul Strader was hired as a screenwriter. His knack for exploring tormented, existential characters made him an ideal choice, and his screenplay retained the novel's dark, introspective tone, delving deeply into the psyche of Frank Pierce, the haunted paramedic at the story's center. Before he wrote the script, Paul went out on several ambulance runs to get a feel of what EMTs have to put up with on a normal night. Martin Scorsese, intrigued by the novel, signed on to direct. Scorsese has also had a long-standing interest in gritty urban narratives, and his previous collaborations with Schrader, especially on Taxi Driver, made him a natural fit for this movie. His direction aimed to capture the frenetic energy of New York City and its inhabitants. I know you. Uh, you don't know me. Oh, yes, I do, Pedro. You don't know me. I, I do, I do. I know you. I, I know him. I know him. I don't think so. This movie has a huge cast, but let's start out with the standout first, Nicolas Cage. He was cast as Frank Pierce, bringing his unique intensity and depth to the role. Cage's portrayal of a man on the brink of psychological collapse is not only compelling, but also heartbreaking. It's definitely him at his A-game. Originally, Paul Schrader had Edward Norton in mind for the role of Frank. Can you imagine how that would have drastically changed the film? Patricia Arquette, who was married to Cage at the time, plays Mary Burke, a woman who becomes a source of solace for Frank amidst his turmoil. The other members of the supporting cast include John Goodman, Ving Rhames, Mark Anthony, Ada Turturro, Cliff Curtis, and Tom Sizemore. Also in a Don't Blink or You'll Miss It role is Judy Reyes. She plays an ICU nurse and would later go on to play a huge role as a nurse on Scrubs. And last but not least, Martin Scorsese and Queen Latifah provide voiceover roles for the two dispatchers. You gotta hand it to Marty to always cameo in his own films. I'm not your baby, young. I'm not your mother either. Ooh. You go into a cardiac arrest. It's a club. Take the back end. Ah, 10-4, sweet mama. Production began in December of 1998. Filming took place in Manhattan and was shot over 65 days. The filming took place at night to accurately depict the paramedics' graveyard shifts, which presented challenges in terms of logistics and maintaining continuity. The filmmakers also had to ensure the authenticity of the medical procedures and equipment used by the paramedics. Cinematographer Robert Richardson employed dynamic lighting and camera techniques to mirror Frank's disoriented mental state, often using handheld cameras that would create a sense of immediacy and chaos. 
chaos. When production wrapped, Marty would go on record stating he hated filming this because of the harsh December weather conditions. Why did you kill me, Frank? I didn't kill you. No, you didn't, Frank, and thank you, but there's still a couple hours left on our ship. As in any Scorsese film, we are treated to a standout soundtrack, usually some Rolling Stone songs. Here as well, Marty selected a diverse range of songs that reflect the film's themes and enhance its atmosphere. Some of these tracks include songs by Van Morrison, The Clash, R.E.M., UB40, Martha and the Vandellas, and The Who. The songs also complement Elmer Bernstein's original score and make for a very engaging narrative. Before we continue with our video, here's a reminder to click the store tab on any of our Joe Blow channels and browse our collection of the latest and freshest designs in our merch store. Go get you some. Bringing Up the Dead will release in theaters on October 22nd, 1999. On its opening weekend, it ranked in fourth place, behind newcomer The Best Man, and grossed $6 million. Sadly, its domestic box office run was short, only grossing $16 million in total. Its budget was $55 million, so this was considered a huge flop. Currently, the film sits with a 73% on Rotten Tomatoes, with the critics' consensus saying, quote, stunning and compelling, Scorsese and Cage succeed at satisfying the audience, end quote. Roger Ebert gave the film a 4 to 4 rating saying, quote, to look at bringing out the dead, to look, indeed, at almost any Scorsese film, is to be reminded that film can touch us urgently and deeply, end quote. Stuart Klons of The Nation wasn't so kind to Cage's performance, saying, quote, it's another burnout role for Nicolas Cage, to which he brings his vast repertoire of grimaces and shuffles, as if he were variously impersonating a gargoyle on amphetamines and late Elvis on downers, end quote. Years later, Scorsese reflected on Ebert's criticism and said, quote, I had 10 years of ambulances, my parents in and out of hospitals, calls in the middle of the night. I was exercising all of that. Those city paramedics are heroes and saints. I grew up next to the Bowery watching the people who worked there, the Salvation Army, Dorothy Day's Catholic Worker Movement, all helping the lost souls. They're the same sort of people, end quote. He wanted to come here. He said that the nurses in misery were the best. All I want is a cup of water. All right, fine. I'll kick someone out of bed three. Bringing Out the Dead was released on VHS and DVD on March 28, 2000. Typically, when Paramount would release DVDs back in the day, you'd be lucky if it came with any special features at all, besides the film's trailer. So with this movie, it might not be much, but Paramount kindly provided cast and crew interviews. Strangely, we've never seen a high-def release for this movie, until now. Paramount recently announced that they will be releasing a 4K set as part of the Paramount Presents line on September 17, 2024. It will come packed with new bonus bonus features, including tons of new interviews by the cast and crew. I don't know about you, but you can bet I will be purchasing this day one. Please, go step back. Now, I've already told you two to step back. Please, mister. Now look, don't make me take off my sunglasses. Through its depiction of Frank Pierce, a paramedic haunted by his failures, the film delves into complex themes that resonate deeply with audiences. So let's highlight a few of them. At the film's core, it's about redemption. Frank is consumed by guilt over the lives that he couldn't save, especially a girl named Rose. This guilt manifests as haunting visions and insomnia, driving him to the brink of collapse. The theme of redemption is intricately woven into Frank's nightly encounters, each call for help presenting another opportunity to atone for past failures. The film portrays redemption as a challenging, often elusive goal, highlighting the internal struggle Frank endears as he seeks solace and forgiveness. His journey is also one of isolation. His job isolates him from a normal life, and his inability to save lives isolates him from his colleagues and himself. The film's depiction of New York City at night enhances this sense of isolation, with the city appearing both vast and lonely. However, moments of connection offer glimpses of hope. Frank's interactions with Mary Burke provide brief reprieves from his loneliness. Their developing relationship serves as a counterpoint to Frank's isolation, suggesting that human connection can be a source of healing even amidst despair. And finally, the film's setting in New York City at night serves as a backdrop for exploring urban despair and fleeting moments of hope. The city is depicted as a place of both relentless suffering and potential redemption. The harsh realities of this urban life are portrayed through encounters with its drug addicts, the homeless individuals, and other types of people. Scorsese's depiction of the city captures its duality, reflecting the broader themes of suffering and redemption. It don't work that way, Frank. I've been there, son. 
You need the Holy Ghost, right? So Bringing Out the Dead is a film that resonates with me on multiple levels, making it one of my all-time favorites. One of the primary reasons I love it, and probably others will agree, is because of Martin Scorsese's unparalleled direction. He brings his signature style to the film, capturing that energy and gritty reality that New York's nighttime streets offer. His ability to balance raw intensity with moments of quiet reflection is really remarkable, and it creates a compelling and immersive experience. It basically kept me engaged from start to finish. We can't not talk about Nicolas Cage. As we've stated before, this is an unforgettable performance. His nuanced performance captures the vulnerability and desperation of a man on the brink of collapse. It makes Frank's quest for redemption all that more poignant. So, despite its dark and intense subject matter, Bringing Out the Dead manages to find moments of connection and humanity amidst the chaos and despair. These moments of human connection serve as a counterbalance to the film's darker aspects, highlighting the resilience and strength of the human spirit. This city, it'll kill you if you aren't strong enough. Well, the city doesn't discriminate. It gets everybody. Over time, the film has gained recognition for its unflinching portrayal of the emotional and psychological toll on emergency responders. It is now appreciated as an underrated gem in Scorsese's filmography, and as we've said, it's noted for its raw emotional power and stylistic boldness. The film's reevaluation by critics, enthusiastic word of mouth, and increased accessibility through home media, mostly its streaming services, have further cemented this status as a cult classic. In conclusion, Bringing Out the Dead is a film that I appreciate for its masterful direction, compelling performances, and deep thematic exploration. It's something beautiful that stayed with me after the credits started rolling, and will make me want to visit it for a long time to come. Forgive me, Rose. It's not your fault. No one asked you to suffer. That was your idea.